Join us for this six-week series on resurrecting unity and harmony in our world, beginning with our own lives. Well, we are in the final week of our series on managing conflict. We've learned a lot, I think, over the last five years, five weeks, it may seem like five years, but uh, we've been learning a lot, I think, about techniques to manage conflict in a healthy and a Christian way. We've learned, for instance, about holding our tongues during a dispute and starting to really listen to the other person. We've talked about how to avoid negative behaviors, you know, like gossiping about the situation rather than confronting the person we need to talk to or attributing bad will to the other person instead of assuming the best, or jumping to conclusions instead of trying to understand the real source of the conflict. We also talked about how to make a good apology and how to avoid a bad one. How and why we should forgive, we talked about that, and then what to do when you're in a stubborn, deep-rooted conflict that just won't go away. That's a lot that we covered, and you can watch all of these messages on our website if you missed any or want to share them with your friends or just want to review them. Because learning all this is great, but the hard part is moving from theory into action, to putting it into practice. Jesus once said that the one who listens and does not act is like a person who built a house on the ground without a foundation. And that won't last even through the first storm. Well, I found that out the hard way last week. A young family with three children invited me out to dinner after Sunday Mass. We had a great time until the waiter came and asked if we wanted dessert. Now, the parents were distracted momentarily, and so even though I clearly was not paying for dinner, I said, of course, desserts all around, and I ordered ice cream sundaes for the kids and myself. Now, the kids up to that moment had been perfect angels, well-behaved, but literally seconds after consuming their ice cream, they went berserk. One of them started dancing around our table, not kidding, while the youngest was trying to climb the walls, literally trying to climb the walls. A lady over at the next table, you guys know what I'm talking about. A lady over at the next, they have have two little ones. A lady over at the next table looked over at us disapprovingly and the dad got upset. And he glanced over at my end of the table and he said, see, this is what happens when they get too much sugar. Well, I took that as a challenge, and without stopping to consider his point of view, I shot right back. I said, well, you're the dad. You could have said no. You had veto power. You should have been paying attention anyway. Oh, yeah. (laughs) See what I did there? I got defensive because I thought he was blaming me for how the kids were acting. I didn't even check it out with him first. And on top of that, I didn't understand that the comment wasn't even directed towards me. See, he and his wife apparently had been having an ongoing friendly debate about the kid's intake of that powerful drug called sugar. So here I am, I'm up here preaching all these great strategies for conflict resolution, and I ended up jumping to conclusions, assuming bad intentions, and responding defensively. And then, when the dad hustled the kids out of the restaurant to avoid further embarrassment, I made one more mistake. I turned to his wife and I triangulated. I said, what's his problem? (laughs) She said, well, he has a lot of problems. (laughs) Finally, as if trying to check off every mistake in the Managing Conflicts handbook, I later apologized to him begrudgingly for ordering dessert, but did not talk about my own other bad behavior like contradicting him in front of the kids. Now I promise I'm usually a great dinner guest and I love to go out to dinner so don't let that dissuade you but in my defense it's not exactly easy applying all these principles of conflict management to real life situations. Sometimes things just take a wrong turn and that's why this week we're going to talk about how you put into action 
an agreement that you've come, you've had a conflict with someone, you come to an agreement with them, but then how do you make sure it sticks, right? How do you make sure it sticks? Maybe you've reached a meeting of minds, but what do you do when nothing seems to change? You know, the other side doesn't abide by the agreement. Like maybe when you've agreed to limit the kids' sugar, but then the stupid priest you've invited to dinner blithely orders desserts all around. Or when you've made a family decision to reduce the number of Christmas presents the kids get each year, but then grandma and grandpa just can't help themselves. Or you've agreed to a household budget, right? In order to reduce cost and increase your savings, but then your hubby runs out and buys the latest golf clubs because he just had to have them and everybody else at the club has them. Or maybe somebody has agreed to stop saying something that hurts you, but then does it again. What do you do in that case? Well, there's, this week we're gonna be looking at a few things that you can do when your agreement seems to be unraveling. Think of it like troubleshooting, where things took a wrong turn. Now, there's three things I just wanna cover. There's a lot we could do, but there's three things I wanna cover. Probably the c most common problem areas. One is, w is asking yourself whether you tried to fix the problem too quickly with the other person. Maybe you drove too hard of a bargain, you know, and maybe, or, or maybe you ended up with an agreement that later didn't seem fair to the other person. People aren't going to abide by an agreement that seems unfair. Now, if that happened, if you, if you, if you rushed to solve the problem too quickly, maybe without talking enough, the best thing is to go back and talk to that person. And when you do, maybe try something different. A lot of times when we rush into like solving a problem with someone, it's because we're trying to get rid of the problem quickly. But what happens is we end up steamrolling over people uh, without meaning to because we just want to get rid of the problem, but we often think of the problem as the person, right? We're trying to get rid of the problem quickly, so what do we end up doing? Get ridding, getting rid of the person. And that's problematic because the problem is the problem, not the other person, although it's tempting to see them as the problem. And so when you go back to the drawing board and you're talking about the agreement that's not working, talk to that person and try to visualize the problem as something out here that you're solving side by side. You're solving it together. Separate the problem from the person. Also, make sure that the interests of everyone in the conflict are as aligned as much as possible. When everybody's interests are aligned, it's more likely that um, the agreement is gonna work. Now, the second thing is that you might wanna check if your agreement's not working with someone is that there may have been some kind of lingering doubts that were never talked about when you came up with the original agreement. Maybe you or the other person had some misgivings or concerns or the feeling that something you're about to agree on might be against your better judgment, right? That's happened to me many times. I agree to something and I'm like, there's something in the back of my brain that says, that's, just, that's against my better judgment, but I didn't say anything and then things go bad. Well, when they do, go back and talk to that person about those doubts because maybe he or she was having those doubts too. Let's just say, for instance, that you're bargaining over, oh, I don't know, sugary treats for the kids. Maybe you both see eye to eye, you want to restrict the amount of ice cream or candy they can have, but maybe you came to too draconian of a solution. No sugar ever, right? And it's not working because maybe you didn't talk about your, some doubt you had about how feasible it was to do that. Especially when Uncle Father Roger comes over and he loves desserts, right? The things go bad, things go bad and you have to go back to the drawing board because you didn't consider whether it was feasible enough even though that was a doubt in the back of your brain. And when that happens, maybe you, you can just talk about it some more talk about your doubts so that your ultimate agreement gets stronger. Well, the last mistake that could lead to trouble in solving a conflict and end up unraveling a deal is something we hope would never happen but actually does. Someone played dirty. 
and the conversation itself was unfair. Has this ever happened to you? Like every time you thought you were coming to an agreement with someone about uh, troubling behavior, the other person just asks for one more concession or they start making veiled threats or they brought up issues from the past to try to confuse the situation. You might not have been fully aware that it was happening, but had some sort of a, you know, a gut feeling that you were being manipulated, but you gave in anyway. Well, the best thing to do in that situation is to go back again to that person. You got to talk and call it for what it is. Be very polite, but you can say, look, I think the reason that this isn't working is because it felt like you might not have been acting in good faith. Stand your ground with that person. But if it doesn't work, always have an escape plan, a way out. Sometimes it's not possible for the parties to agree. In that event, it makes more sense for each person to go their separate ways with respect for one another. And your paths may cross again in the future, and at that time an agreement may be possible. But realizing you always have a way out protects your power to choose and prevents you from making an unwise agreement. Well, those are just three quick things that you could do if you find that in a conflict your agreement is falling apart and you need to go back and revisit it. Wherever you are in the process of conflict resolution, though, I want you to remember one thing as we leave this series today. It's that conflict resolution ultimately is not about solving problems. It's not about agreeing to effective strategies. It's certainly not about only getting what you want. At the end of the day, the reason that we try to manage conflict in a healthy and loving way is so everyone can grow closer to Christ. The end goal of the art of Christian conflict is communion. The kind of communion that we're all going to have one day in heaven. So we better get used to it now. In the gospel passage this week, Jesus talks about two ways of living. One that's good <laughs> and one that's evil. And no matter what form evil comes in, it always divides people. It always creates conflict. Sin scatters, separates. It comes between people. Sin causes division and it breaks communion. And when that happens, Jesus said in the gospel, there are two ways of approaching it. There's the avenue of tough love, right? Sometimes you just have to confront the other person for their own good. That's hard to do. We don't like judging. But Jesus says, remove the wooden beam from your eye first. Then you will see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eyes. You normally, when we read that, we think, oh, well, we're not supposed to judge. I'm not supposed to judge anybody. But that's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying you can never correct someone else's behavior if they're going down a bad path. He's saying that you should avoid a critical spirit and make sure you've looked at your own behavior first. Once you've corrected your own conduct, you can and should open a healthy discussion about conflicts or problems with the other person. Now sometimes it's tough love is not what's needed, but a different kind of love, more of a nurturing love. Jesus goes on to say in the gospel, he says that a good tree does not bear rotten fruit, nor does a rotten tree bear good fruit. That seems kind of obvious, right? But here's the thing, a rotten tree can become a good tree with a little love. Later in the gospel, Jesus tells a parable about a fig tree that wasn't bearing any fruit at all. It was a bad tree. It was a rotten tree. It seemed to be dead. And the owner wanted to chop it down. But the gardener said, I'll cultivate the ground around it. I'll fertilize it. I'll nourish it. And it may bear fruit in the future. You see, patience and love can transform anything, even troubled relationships. After all, the Bible in the first reading says today, the fruit of a tree shows the care 
it has had. Tough love, confrontation, nurturing love. You're going to have to choose wisely which one you pick in a particular situation. But whichever one you pick, they're both based in love. Approaching conflict with love will always bear good fruit because it will bring people together in love. And that's the goal. That's the goal of every rift, of every division. It is bringing people back together in loving communion. I want to conclude this series um, with a really just a simple little story, but it touches my heart. And I know it's a little simplistic, maybe even a little naive. I tend to be that way and I brag about it. Um, I'm a little Pollyannish. But as I think about bombs exploding in Eastern Europe, air raid, uh, air raids happening in the Ukraine, these horrible pictures that we see on the news constantly, I think about this simple man that I'm going to tell you about that I knew once doing a very simple thing in the world. But somehow it brings healing and hope, at least to me, and I hope it does you. When I was going to graduate school in Los Angeles, I lived in an apartment building, and the entrance to the building was this, it had kind of a big atrium, and it had glass door fronts, and in the lobby there were these two chairs. No one ever sat in those chairs. No one ever took the time to sit in those chairs, except one man. He was a 94-year-old retired Superior Court judge. Everyone just called him Judge. <laughs> Every day, the Justice of the Peace would sit in one of those chairs. He had his baseball cap on and his cane by his side. And he told everyone who passed by in the morning to have a good day. And don't worry what happened to them, it's going to be okay. And every night when they came home, he would welcome them home. Be sitting in that chair saying, welcome home. I could always count on his smiling face, reassuring me, making me feel loved and welcomed no matter what was going to happen to me that day or what had happened to me. But one day, Judge wasn't there anymore. And I found out later he had had a, he had a few accidents <laughs> and the management asked him not to sit in the chair but to stay home. Well, I guess it broke his heart because he died very shortly thereafter. And I missed him. I found it remarkable that this man, who was an intellectual powerhouse, a person with enormous respect, a magistrate for whom everyone in the courtroom would stand when he entered, a public servant who had spent his career helping people resolve conflicts peacefully in a court of law, he did not spend his retirement writing lofty legal articles or chronicling his memoirs or telling everyone stories about how amazing he used to be. Instead, he simply chose to spend his remaining days trying to make people feel loved and feel that they were part of a community and that they were together. And in doing that, I think Judge gave us a small taste of heaven. That judge, ever so gently, in his own humble and simple way, reminded us all to mind the gap.